Hey everyone, this is Urs, and coming back at you with another preview of my next LP. That's right, we are moving on ahead, as I'm sure, hopefully, you're enjoying the journey of the Franks through the world as they uh, spread their piety and bloodshed everywhere. That sounded kind of wrong, but hey, whatever. We are going to go right into another series as soon as that one is done. This time, uh, by now in my two LPs, you're probably thinking, Urs... Are you an absolute psychopath who will not rest till all your enemies are crushed under your heels? Ah, uh, not quite. I am, I am also kinder, gentler, more interesting than a pure militaristic dictator. So we will try to be kinder and gentler this time. We'll be playing the Civ called the Aymara, uh, led by Tupac Katari. No, not the rapper. Uh, this is from a collection of civs called Patria Grande. Uh, it's by a coder slash artist named Luigi, who's one of the other big names in the modding scene. He's got a collection focusing on civilizations of colonial and pre-colonial uh, Latin America and the Caribbean. So check those out. They'll be in the comments, as always. And, you know, he's got some pretty neat stuff there. So I wanted to show off one of his civs. And this one will be compatible with events and decisions, as will all the civs that I'm planning on using. Not all of his Patria Grande civs are compatible with events and decisions, but he does a good job of telling you which are and which are not. So if you go to the site, you'll be able to pick and choose, depending if that's your thing. So as I mentioned, we will be using events and decisions. I think that, like I said, adds to the historical flavor of the civ. Besides just being neat and all those events that kind of happen, I kind of like that. Uh, also, we'll be using more pantheons, more luxuries, like I said, adding to the game without unbalancing it anyway, and I likely keep using enhanced user interface. It was really convenient last time, jumping around uh, to places a lot quicker. So, without uh, belaboring that, let's get to look at the uh, Civ itself. So, their unique, unique, yes, yes, very nice, their unique ability is called dualism and reciprocity. Uh, two parts, one part is pretty interesting. Uh, so, first of all, land trade routes established with city-states, grant food and faith, based on the amount of gold earned through the trade routes. So, kind of encouraging you to put trade routes to city-states by land, rather than other civs. So that's kind of neat. Normally, you kind of do that with other civs for money and science. But this way, it's food and faith. So, very vertical growth-oriented. The second half, having an even number of cities grants a combat bonus and increased faith in all cities. Now, this is actually really interesting. I don't know the historical basis for this. Uh, if, if you do know, go ahead and leave some info in the comments, because that's this is actually pretty, pretty interesting. I'm not sure if they had, like, pairs of villages or something, or how this worked out back in the day, or where this idea of even numbers of cities came from, but something to do with the reciprocity aspect, I suppose. But this is kind of neat. Uh, it kind of makes you do two or four or six cities, not like the three or five or whatever is... A little more uncommon. So this could be really neat to play with. Uh, their unique unit is a Malku. Uh, if I'm mispronouncing that, I am sorry. It is a settler replacement, and you'll notice the hammer cost is ridiculously low. And uh, here you go. Cheaper to train and does not stop city growth when trained. So that is huge. They get extra movement on hills and more sight. And the neat part is, after founding a city, the Malku stays alive and earns a great general promotion. But this unit is lost when leaving friendly territory. So... Not only, it's kind of like insurance against forward settling on someone. You drop a city and you get a free great general right there. Kind of a neat way to go about things. Uh, I'm not sure. I mean, yes, the production cost is much lower than a standard settler. And the city growth doesn't stop when trained. But that's kind of a double-edged sword because usually when you're training a settler, you can intentionally, quote-unquote, starve the city by putting everything on production and it won't affect your actual city growth. Whereas here, you will need to keep working those food tiles while you're training the settler. So I'm not really sure early game if this is going to make it any faster or slower to get your cities out. Kind of a neat idea, I think. We'll have to see how it pans out. Later game, I guess, once your capital is more developed, you don't have to worry about, you know, popping out a settler in three turns in your capital and slowing your population growth that way. So that could be good later on. Early on, I'm not sure how much of an advantage this will actually be. But three movements always nice, and extra movement in hills. Get those cities at least in the locations you want faster. The uh, unique building is the Apacheta, which is a replacement for the shrine. It's pretty much like a standard shrine, except you uh, get 25% increased land route range, kind of synergistic with this whole send land routes to city-states and profit idea. And generates plus one faith if there's a land trade route originating, yes, English good, from this city. So again, really kind of synergistic with the unique ability. So... I'm going to try a less militaristic, more friendly, kinder, gentler kind of way to play. We're going to go for a diplomatic, cultural, and or science victory, depending on the situation. 
This does not mean, however, there will not be war. Uh, it is very likely we are going to end up spawning next to Attila, Monty, and the Zulu. With, I don't know, maybe Russia thrown in for good measure. And we're going to have to go to war and defend ourselves. Who knows? We're not sure where it's going to go, but at least going into this game, I will try to restrain my warmongery urges and try to play peacefully and smartly and get along with my fellow man to an extent. To an extent. I'm going to caveat that. Difficulty will be immortal, standard pace, uh, standard map size, pretty much all the standards we're used to seeing. Uh, I will likely stick with Oval on this one, not necessarily because I'm wedded to this template, and I really hope you're not bored of Oval. I think it's a really interesting map template, honestly, one of my favorites, but I don't want to suddenly change the continents and everyone be like, oh man, you're not playing Warlike, so you didn't go over Pangea, I want to stay safer, like, yeah, go to continents or something, so... <laughs> <laughs> not, not that I'm accusing any of you of doing that, but uh, I will likely stay with Oval for this one. But if any of you have any ideas for a particular map type you want me to see play for the next LP, uh, go ahead, leave that in the comments. Let me know if there's something you want to see or say, hey, just drop it on random and see what happens. I'm totally willing to do that too and see how it pans out. So I think that's the format for this LP. So join me for a kinder, gentler, but not completely war-free uh, Civ game with the Aymara from Lu Leuji's uh, Patria Grande collection. Again, always the mod information will be in the comments below so you can check those out. And I look forward to having you on this journey with me as well. In the meantime, enjoy the Franks and I will see you soon. Thanks so much. I've been Nurse. Till then.